I was just given this Indonesian batik shirt. Someone said it's kind of like Hawaiian, but not. It's a strange shirt that I'm going to wear here, unless any of you want. No. Actually, I like bizarre things. Every so often, you never know what's going to happen. Thank you, Bob. That was uh, appreciated. That prayer. He's my chauffeur, and uh, reminds me of. Uh, you may have heard the story about the chauffeur with a, with a physicist who used to give uh, lectures around the country. And it was always the same lecture, though, and the chauffeur began to, he noticed the, uh, he would sit in the auditorium every time. He figured, you know, you've, you've been in the auditorium every time I've done this. Uh, I bet you've memorized it. Probably do, yeah. I tell you what, this next place we're going to, they don't have a photo of me. You just recite the memorized lecture and I'll wear, dress up as the chauffeur, and I'll sit in the audience, and you'll be me, and I'll, I'll be you. They agreed to do it. And it went really, really well, went swimmingly, as they would say. But uh, then what was horror, they dis he discovered there'd be a Q&A session. And so the chauffeur knew of nothing of what, of what he was speaking. So the first question, he didn't even understand the question, but he was very, very quick to the point, and he said, that question is so easy, even my chauffeur back there can answer it. <laughs> so you never know who's the, who's the chauffeur, you see, and, and who's the speaker. You never can be sure sometimes. I've had people who know my stuff better than I do, which is a very bizarre thought. But um, we are now moving on to uh, and continuing on our little story of the attributes of God, which has gotten a little bit more extensive, but um, it's been coming a m much more of an intriguing thing. I want to share yet another um, level that I've experienced with this. So it's actually become a personal exercise, but uh, we've been talking about various attributes of God, and these are the typical attributes you see. In fact, I have a, a document here that, um, where I list what I call the standard list, and you won't be able to, I have to make them larger, but beauty, uh, rather uh, eternity, faithfulness, immutability, we've, we've, and we've loved, covered a number of these. Uh, we're going to be looking at two more today. But then it occurred to me last about a week ago or so that there are others that seem to be just as ultimate but have never been listed in, in things I've seen. So I added 15. Um, and uh, just, it was just kind of an exercise. I added about 10 and then thought of a bunch more. And I'm proposing new things that in my mind actually have very much legitimacy. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. So here's the, the standard list then that you'd see. And finally, and frankly, I found this to be a useful exercise by putting them together. And I did this for you just before last Friday, I believe it was, and showed it to you then. That was the first time I'd ever created it. And so this was my list. And I thought it was interesting if you could compare, pick any two. And it becomes an exercise, so I can just randomly go here, okay? How does the love of God affect the justice of God? How do they temper? Because all of God's is one, and all of his attributes really are part of a unity in his rich diversity. Um, and you could just take any two or three. But then it occurred to me that um, there are some things that have been missed, and these are the ones I've just added, you see. That's, so there's a, now you, now you don't see it, now you do. So note that, and wham. That's a bunch more. I've added poetry, you see, because he's a poet. And you see, maybe we haven't been artistic enough, you see. You need to have a bit of a soul of a poet or something like that. But he's also, I think, dance and, and um, um, mysteries. I've added mysteries because there are things about God of which he's revealed nothing at all. And you don't have a clue. You couldn't even begin to understand the category he's describing. But one day we will, more and more, but uh, he'll always be more. I think of him as a craftsman. So you could speak of the craftsmanship of God as well as the wisdom of God because he is that. He's an architect as well. So architecture, what would you say about the architecture of God? And he is a divine architect, and you see that motif throughout, even considering eight chapters devoted to the, to the, the Ezekiel temple. Um, the idea of his uh, being uh, of art and love and mercy and so forth, but brilliance as well. 
And I, I, I see that. And what about the pleasure of God? Because you see, that is something, it always be for his own good pleasure, but he is the wellspring of pleasure. So I distinguish that a little bit from these others. So I'm kind of, these are just proposed. I'm chewing them, that's all I'm doing. And so here's the exercise I do. So you'll notice now, I can take any, any two of these, for example, in this case, joy and sovereignty, I just happened to randomly pick. And it would be a very interesting creative exercise for me to think through, how does the joy of God and the sovereignty relate together? Or take three, um, in this case, I grab these three, or, the, or you could have four. Or another way of approaching it would be these. It would be, um, how, let's take the hardest one of all for people is the wrath of God. Would you not agree? Because frankly, uh, I'm saying obedience requires both fear of, and trust, and we do have this side of the fear of God and the awe and holiness and the love of God, the, the love of God, as it were. But they are both really not at loggerheads, but they actually re reinforce each other. So the wrath of God, in, in wrath, remember mercy, you see? And so you could, just do, you could just do a teaching right now, or you could just do, and how does wrath relate to his love, you see? How do you connect those two together? And you could discuss that. You could discuss his goodness and how each of them plays off of each other in their different facets of his, of his in, in, infinite being. But that's just something I've been chewing on. And in doing so, I've also found, and I think I've, I've sent this to you, did I not, this uh, document here, uh, for you to use as your exercise, the attributes of God. Did you not get this? Uh, I hope you try using this. This is a little document I made for you from uh, Handbook to Renewal. And in Handbook to Renewal, it has a topical renewal guide. And in this, I took this little portion about the person of God and then all these verses. These are affirmations from, in biblical order about the person of God. Then about the powers of God. For example, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. The Lord will be gracious to whom he'll be gracious, and he'll compa have compassion on whom he'll have compassion. Powers of God. And then I also looked as well at the perfections of God coming up. So there's quite a few of these, as you can see. So we come up to here to the perfections of God. So far be it for you to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all the earth do right? And that's actually one of the things we're going to look at this morning is the justice of God. We're going to be looking at two things that once again might wonder, how do they connect together? But I'm arguing, though, and it's very critical, that all the attributes really reinforce each other. He's in his uh, perfections. So it'd be a really, and I've tried this, try using some of these verses. Just work your way through it. It's even better if you put some music on that would be help you in the contemplative mode, you see, because you're, la you're layering your sensory experience. Even images can be very helpful. So you've got to be more creative. We get out of, uh, out of these ruts, you see. But if I play music and read these texts of Scripture, and there's none like you, it's a great devotional exercise. And uh, I'll even be happy to send you my contemplative uh, playlists if you want. And my, uh, I have a couple of others, several classical and some contemporary. But at any rate, this is what I'd like you to do is please give this a go. I think you've all got a copy. If you haven't, do see Dennis. Uh, and try this exercise because you have the document and pick something to listen to and just work your way through and meditate on it and see how your experience of God goes because the most important thing you can think about is, of course, Him. What, is, what greater topic is there than the wellspring of everything that's good and tr true and beautiful? Another thing that I also uh, d developed just last night, speaking of that, is this, again, fresh bread for you, because I like to kind of throw things out. And so this is uh, just last night when uh, I was with Karen, we were, um, I was watching this. We watch sometimes a TV show, uh, like in this case, the, the, um, the uh, Midsummer Murders. You see, it's always a formula. It's always three murders. It's always a pattern murder where they have to leave the victim in a certain way. It's the people who are involved, are, there's always a mansion. Uh, there's always, they always save the person, on the, on the fourth person from getting killed. It's very formulaic, but it's good fun and she enjoys it. So we were watching that. It doesn't take much of my mind so I can do a lot of work. So, <laughs> and that's why, that's, why you, that's why you behold what you're seeing here. So I thought of again, beauty, goodness, and truth. And beauty is the, is the entry, you see. It's the, it's the port, it's the port way of God. You see, once again, you see the mystery of God is mystery connects 
actually, uh, is connected by beauty. And God approaches us and ravages us if we have the eyes to see the wonders that he's created. And more and more fully, now that they're being amped up because of technology. And so they invite us into the uh, understanding of the goodness and truth of God. And again, it's like a way of what I say, think of as uh, often the analogy is they're like getting you past the watching dragons of critical objections because you're, you're won over by wonder of beauty, you see, and that wonder hits the heart. So when a per, even if an atheist sees the Lord of the Rings, there's something that he evokes in that person that is more than an atheistic narrative because materialism is not good enough. There's a clear sense of right and wrong, of beauty and ugliness, of, of, uh, of, of, of truth and error, and all of these things, you can see it, good and evil. And they, we know it, we resonate with it. So it speaks to the heart and it can get to us. But at any rate, I was thinking about these three, uh, they're called the transcendentals, and I've now put them in this order. Used to have it where truth was first, and then goodness, and then beauty. But there's the, this is the way he approaches us through beauty, and he, he draws us in this way, and creates longings with us in us as well. I essentially associate beauty more with the role of the Holy Spirit, the goodness with the Father, because it was the goodness of God who sent his Son, you see. It was goodness we'll see means benevolence. What does that mean? What are those two words? It comes from two Latin words. Benevolence. What, is those, what are those two words? Bene and volens. Bene means good, you see. Good. And volens, voluntary, volitional, will. So be benevolence literally means good will. And you've heard me describe and define agape, essentially, as the steady intention of your will to another's highest good. That's benevolence. Your, good, your will, you always will what's best. Even for your enemy, you can love your enemy in that way. You may not like him, but you can will their best good. And you see, that's the benevolence of God. So I see that is uh, what the Father has been, and we'll see more about that in just a moment. And truth, the Vologos, the, the living word, you see. And then I realized as well that um, we are aesthetic beings, we're moral beings, we're rational beings. And so that we are made in the image of the one who made these transcendentals. So you are an aesthetic being. It's intriguing as well if you compare Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant. This is a glittering generality, but generally speaking, there is more of an emphasis on beauty and orthodoxy, on goodness and Catholicism, and in truth and Protestantism. And the, note the truth goes back, who is it? The Son. Whereas the Orthodox are going to be focused, Catholic more on the Father, and then the Orthodox are the work of the Spirit. At least that's my high speculations for you. So that's all I'm going to be doing for that. So more than you expected, I realize, but uh, just new things I'm chewing on. So the way I test things out is just to yap at it, at you, I, which I just did. First time I've ever presented it in that way. And that was, eh, maybe that, maybe so. But I, try, I send it out for your, your thought, because I love to keep creating new ideas and then testing them out. But what we're going to be looking at today, looking at Tozer's book, The uh, Knowledge of the Holy, is, is two attributes, the goodness of God and the justice of God, very simply. And uh, just zoom down a little bit more into what I was just saying about the goodness of God, where you see he uses the word, uh, that which disposes him uh, to be kind, cordial, benevolent. There's the word benevolent, goodwill. He takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. And I like that image, holy pleasure. That God, that your, your pleasure, you see, when you can delight, you, he delights in you and, and you can bless the Lord yourself. Bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name. So there's a mutuality of, of, of a, a holy pleasure. And it's really this idea of, of his benevolence, of his goodwill, of his goodness is absolutely necessary, as he says, to moral sanity. Because you see, if God is not good, then there's no distinction between kindness and cruelty and heaven and hell and heaven can be hell and hell heaven, which is exactly where we've gone in our culture, effectively, because if you really stop and think of it, I won't go into details here, but we've moved into a, con a culture, that, that, a conscience that has been natural conscience. We all have a sense of good and evil, of right and wrong. We can't help it. Even, even the denier of God can't get around that term. They don't want to use the word evil, though, because it would imply that there's an absolute for good. 
That's the problem if being a relativist. But you can sear your conscience by violating what you know in your heart is, is something that's right. And having seared it, you can defile it, and then finally you can even make it go and become the, uh, go the other way around and have an evil conscience. An evil conscience is where you take the high, the high moral ground on pursuing those things that the Bible condemns and condemning the things that the Bible commends. You take the high moral ground on this because what you now have, you really are using your conscience, but you've defiled it and distorted it. And woe to those who call good evil and evil good, who confuse salt with, with, with sweet. You see, it's Isaiah 5.20. So it's actually possible. This is why we have people in our culture right now who are actually taking the high ground and really believe it, that their views, which are utterly unbiblical, are correct, and that we are completely wrong. But they, they do it with moral intention from their point of view, you see. So we are wired that. We can't avoid that, that sense of the image of, the, of God. It's, it's hard wired in us. And again, the, the, the ground of all blessedness, though, is, as Julian of Norwich put it, is, the, um, is as, as she put it, the uh, goodness of, um, of God, and that all things come from him and through him to, to him. Everything shows us that the goodness of God, of his goodness, of his goodness, she keeps repeating in her revelations of divine love. Unmerited, spontaneous goodness. And that drives his act. So the, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son because it was out of his goodness and his goodwill for us that none should perish, but all should come to a knowledge of the truth. And so he actually gives us an option we never would have had before. And he does it not because of, our, because of desert, but because of his goodness, where he, he chooses to give us more than we are worth. And as a consequence, once we want to see, it's self-caused, it's infinite, it's perfect, and it's eternal. And once again, that's quite consistent if you were to go back to this concept here of how do they relate. So if I take the uh, goodness of God, for example, and I've got so many here that I can hardly find it now. There it is over there. If I take the goodness of God, how does it relate to these others? Because clearly it does. Goodness is a, is, his goodness is faithful, and it's all present, you see, and it's a holy goodness. It's a, it's an, it's a, it's a goodness that... Uh, shows his good pleasure and his majesty and, and his infinitude. In other words, all of God's attributes, there's a unity in his diversity. And so there's, there's no merit in human conduct, but actually though this goodness of, of God gives us an option that we wouldn't have otherwise have had. And as he puts it then, repentance, though necessary, is not meritorious, but a condition for receiving the gracious gift of pardon which he gives of his goodness. And so in this, in this notion here then, um, we're talking about repentance, or returning to him, and he gives us better than we deserve. I like this statement, the whole outlook of mankind might be changed if we could all believe that we dwell under a friendly sky and that the God of heaven, though exalted in power and majesty, is eager to be friends with us. Now, he's not being silly and sappy, saying that there's no pain in this world. But when he says they're under a friendly sky, he means how it's going to end at the end of the day. Even if it doesn't end well for us in this world, we're part of a bigger narrative that will continue. And the story is not over until we are home. That's when the story shows. And indeed, it will be a friendly sky. It will be a new world, a new creation, a new cosmos. So this gives us a confidence and a hope in him. And so he goes on to say then, how do we know about him? Uh, what, will be, what was the father like? How will he act? If I come to God, how will he act toward me? Well, he's going to be just like Jesus. And what you know about Jesus tells you about the father. And we look in, at the idea of the prodigal. And remember how the father's love is displayed very clearly when he sees the prodigal coming at a distance, which means he was looking for him. And then he feels compassion for him. He literally runs to him, which is nutty in the ancient Near East. No father would ever do that. And then he embraces his son. That's the father heart of God. If you want to know what the father's like? Look at the son. And so the son then uh, is the one who comes in obedience to the father's directive to, for, a him, for a him to make his sacrifice for us. So if we would be welcomed as the prodigal was, we must come as the prodigal came. And then he tells us about this. The greatness of God rouses fear in us, but his goodness encourages us not to be afraid of him. To fear and not be afraid, that is the paradox of faith. And I think he's quite right. And this is why I, I keep going back to this idea. How can you have both? How can you be 
fear, but not the kind of fear that cowers and cringes that he's going to beat you up or do something awful to you, but a holy fear, a, a sanctified fear, a fear of an awe and an understanding that all your, everything that's good in your life is derivative from his good pleasure. Uh, a holy desire, a sense of, of dread sometimes and amazement at, at his grace and goodness. And so he's re referring it to that then as being the, this paradox of faith. So that's a word about the goodness of God. And then a quick, quick word about the justice of God where justice and righteousness, another attribute of God, and they really are two sides, two effectively justice and righteousness are cognate because righteousness means to conform to a standard, you see. That's really what it means. So you shall have just rate weights, not unjust weights, which means that what you see is what you get. Does it make sense? So they sometimes had two sets of weights and one would be in advantage of the buyer, another of the seller. But your weights shall be just and righteous. And that was the term it would use. So the righteousness of God then is that which, which conforms to a standard. And you've many times heard me make the statement, and you'll hear it again. The righteousness that God requires is that righteousness, which is righteousness requires him to require. I will say that again. You didn't hear it the first time. The righteousness that God requires is that righteousness, which is righteousness requires him to require, which means he cannot grade in a curve. You see, his righteousness requires him, he cannot abide in perfection. His standard is perfection, and indeed the way we can define sin is anything that's contrary to the character of God. That's, he's, he's, his character is the def definition of, of all these things. And so how can he compromise himself then? because you see it requires perfection, then how can he then show grace? And the answer, of course, is that he'd have to underwrite the awful course himself. And how can the judge of the earth be, uh, be, be right? And so he speaks about this whole idea. Redemptive theology teaches that mercy does not become effective toward a man until justice has done its work. You, this means that God, to be just, someone pays the price because in a moral and just universe, you, no one gets away with sin, not, not eventually. Maybe in this life, but not in the next. There is a payday someday. And if a person can get away with it with impunity and without consequence, it's not a moral universe. So God himself cannot violate himself. But instead, he underwrites that awful cost himself by taking it upon himself and the gift of his son so that his redemption, which purchases out of the slave market of sin and death, now releases and frees us into the fullness of the liberty of the freedom of the, of the children of God. It's an astonishing thought. So in that way, Romans says he could be just and yet be the justifier. How can he be just and justify the sinful? That's, the answer is someone pays. Now the option is you've got someone who took, who took, took that, that you don't have to pay. But, a, but someone will pay, and if you do not embrace that, then you're the one who will pay. So this idea of the, that a just penalty for sin was exacted when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. So once again, it is his goodness of God that sends, sends the Son. But again, God's being is unitary. He's never at cross purposes with himself. And that's why you don't want to be selective. Oh, I like this attribute. I don't like that one. But rather, we realize that the ones, why are we not drawn to some of these? It's because of something in us that hasn't yet been trained to love that in God. So you want to love those things in God and come to see him. So you want to develop and ask God for the grace of greater vision of him and to be more thoughtful and to be consumed with him. Because what higher topic can you consider than the one who made all, made you? who made the ones you love, who made the world around you. And that alone, but then he goes more than that because he also reveals, not in his general revelation, but in his special revelation, that you are the special objects of his grace, his care, his love, that you have wooed, he's wooed us, he's pursued us, he's redeemed us, he's set us free from the shackles of death and opened up a way to us, but at what awful price. These are attributes of God then that uh, are so astonishing. In fact, the more we learn about his mysterious nature, 
on every order of magnitude. The microcosm, the, the, what we call, I call the biosphere, the midicosm, uh, I, I call it, but the biosphere, the 12, the, the, just the mystery of life itself and all its richness and complexity. And then the awesome macrocosm of which we see things that we never beheld before. So I find myself more and more choosing to notice him in things that were formerly unknown by looking at images from those realms, you see, and curating and collecting those things. And in doing that, it, it, I find it, it amplifies my vision of God because I let his, his general creation of beauty and wonder that you see, let that which is seen amplify my grasp of what's not seen. And then what the scriptures reveal that are not revealed in nature, namely that the, the one who made all this is the love of your soul, and more than that, he is the one who purchased you at his own death. It's beyond belief. Nothing's like it. So the concept then, you put them together, they enrich one another because this one then made this and then this made. And so it, it amplifies your, your vision of the living God. So I'm, I'm suggesting here then that Tozer is right when he says, when the penitent sinner casts himself upon Christ for salvation, the moral situation is reversed because now we no longer bear the burden, but we receive the grace of the one who did. So he paid for it, but he will not give it to us against our desire. So therein lies that awful mystery of the holy invitation. As, as we see, he invites us, but we must reciprocate. We must respond because he does not want robots or automata. He wants people who, who freely choose to be loved by him and to be owned by him and be possessed by him and be adopted by him. You have to freely choose those things. And once having chosen, the rest is his. Everything is now his. And then you can then give your problems, your pain, your, 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 your difficulties, your depression, your despair, your despondency, all these things that challenge us from every day, from the exterior world and the interior world, all these things that we face because we're in a fallen, uh, sinful world. We know that. But at the same time, we are capable of having the capacity of giving that over to him and, and letting him take that burden off of our shoulders. I've told you this before, but I feel prompted once again just to emphasize uh, the need for you to really zoom in on these texts because in these days, and it's getting darker, the hurricane uh, levels are rising, whatever you say um, about things are not merely what they used to be. And remember, there are new things that never existed because while technology produces wonderful things for us, it also amplifies human wickedness. So it, it, it can be a force multiplier for good and for evil. Now, I choose to use technology as a force multiplier for good. So my intention is to use digital technology as a vehicle of drawing people to the analog world and to the realities of, these, of his truth, goodness, and love. In, in his world. But at the same time, you know, there are so many other things that amplify the wickedness that have never been existing before. And so we live in a world that's roiling with, with wickedness and, and, and one says, how can this be and how does God allow this? And it's, the scriptures give us answers to these questions, but here's where we take this text for ourselves. Whenever you find yourself anxious, whether it's the world around you, whether it's your finances, whether it's a relationship that's broken, whether you discover something that, uh, that appeared on a PET scan or something like that, that um, in all these things, you and I can have a source to whom we turn, the one who is the source of goodness, of justice, of mercy, of righteousness, of re relationship, of, of sanctification, of glory. And if we can turn to him and offer him our, our cares, be anxious for a few things, nothing. And so whenever you discern anxiety, make that your reminder, wait, why am I in distress? Why am I in despair on my soul? Hope in God, he says. So he actually looks at his own inner life, interior life, and notes the things, the emotions that are rolling around under the surface. He may have the right words, but his heart is, is belying him, that there's something more. That he's angry with God because a thing has happened or any number of things. He's despondent, he's fearful. Acknowledge that 
Don't allow that then to continue to be the thing that is your narrative because your interior narrative will shape you and define you. And the more you allow that to define you, the more you get sucked into then to uh, a diminished world. No, your interior narrative is to take those things and offer them to God. That's what this text is telling you. So if you find yourself anxious, it's because you're not really obeying this text. At the end of the day, you get to choose. Do you give it to him or not? Because he, because he says, child, it was, it's, I've taken that now. And it's for me. You have to give it back to me. You're c- trying to carry baggage that's too heavy for you. Give it back to me. And every time I do, um, I have anxiety turns into what? Peace. That transformation. Now, we know what happens. Suddenly it's back again. And the more, every time you, if you train yourself to keep giving it back, keep giving it back, after a while it stays up there more than it stays down here. That's what I'm thinking. So that at the end, after a while through training, you train yourself so that you're spring-loaded to keep it above. It's not that you're not concerned about that person or that situation, but every time the anxiety hits you, it's a for- source of prayer and giving it back to God, you see. And then you can move on um, with peace and poise and purpose in this world. And then, you, then the other component that I, I must stress once again is that these, what you put your, in your mind is so critical so that you want to really use Philippians 4.8 and ask yourself, what do, I do, what do I do in terms of thinking and chewing on in this time in my life? So I want to ask those questions. So we've talked about the goodness of God. We've talked about the justice of God. And again, like we've done before in this little time together, chew on the implications of these for your life. Is there, what, 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 is it, what difference does it make that God is good in your life? What goodness what difference does it make that he's just? And it's, it's, a, it's a sense of righteousness and holiness and goodness and peace and pi, poise and purpose. All these fruit of the Spirit, in my mind, unite together if we will receive them. So it's a question of holding it on to ourselves or giving it back to God. And which is the better course for, for sanity? Giving it back to God is very clear. We'll, we'll, we'll meet in a few minutes. Uh, one of the men asked about, the, um, about Hamburg to renewal. And uh, one, of the, one of the things we were looking at here, I was telling them about the, for the, this is for the Zoomers. I gave them the uh, Dennis Inman, before you're going to be, I hope it's not a hassle for you, for them to, uh, if the Zoomers are not getting the material, then they can contact Dennis and do that. But I need to remember, I'm going to send you an email myself that cap- encapsulates this material as well. So it remind me to send, there's a new version of that that I've done. So I want to send that to you. It, it will also have uh, this, this, and this, but it'll also have the um, Hamburg to, to Renewal selection that I made. And then someone on the Zoom call asked about the Hamburg to Renewal selection. So at the store, it's just Kembo.org, the store where, again, we're about to en- enhance this website a lot, but. Uh, you go to the store, which is you can, as you can see on the on the top here, at the uh, there um, the, the store, and then at the store you have a hammer. Pre- I notice it's on sale, so there's a leather version of it, and there is the paperback version of it. So again, you can get that if you want as well. But the document that I just sent that we're going to send to you is the portion that you need for the uh, attributes of God. Yes. You also send Dennis the. Playlist. Yes, ask for the playlist. Um, I, 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 I have um, a contemplative list, um, and well, actually, I have two contemplative, but I'll give you my contemplative best because, um, and there's about 50 of those, and there's about 150 of the contemplative. And then I'm going to give you my uh, cl- classical gems list, which is, which is good. And then um, there's a kind of contemporary gems I may throw in as well. And I use, then you find what works for you. You see, there's a different thing. But of course, you use your own list if you want. But there's some of these, uh, these uh, this, some of this music is just uh, ravishing, and it can be a wonderful way of enhancing your experience. Once again, remembering there was a good reason why the psalmist set their set those psalms to music. This was not an accident, because the psalms know and God knows the heart. 
and that a person can have the right thinking and the right statements, but yet their heart is roiling with pain and sorrow, and uh, there's a deeper issue that goes on. And sometimes music is what's going to affect us and speak to the heart and, and evoke a longing and so forth. And if it's particularly poignant, it's going to draw us and drive us back to um, that sense of the grace of God. So uh, I can use this. In fact, I even use music in a kind of a form of grief therapy that can be very effective indeed. And I have a, a thing I've done on that as well. And Dennis, I may send you the grief therapy one, which has the playlist. So there would be two separate things then. One would be the that, and then the other one would be this one. So remind me about that, yeah. Can you add a chart on degenerative and regenerative illness? Which, which part was it? Because we were talking about 20 minutes and then we had degeneration. Oh, yeah, there I was talking about the idea of the conscience, and so there I was speaking about uh, the fact that people have a natural conscience and then they can sear their conscience, you see. And then the way you sear your conscience is doing things you know you shouldn't do, basically. And it, it puts a scar on it and it becomes desensitized, doesn't it? And then it becomes so defiled that after a while it's more so habitual that there is then this idea, and you well know that if there's any discrepancy between belief and behavior, what are you going to opt for? You're going to change your beliefs to conform to your behavior almost every time. It's just how we do it. But the reason why people get sucked into it is by gradual degrees, never a blowout, a slow re leak. So by one compromise after another, they can seduce themselves until finally it's so com incompatible with the way we know we are made because we cannot er eradicate the image of God in this. You cannot eradicate a biblical sense of truth, goodness, and beauty. You can't do that. You can distort it, but you can't eradicate it. And as a consequence, the only way we can live with ourselves and embrace unbiblical notions and behaviors is, in fact, to change our beliefs about them. And, there, and that's why it then, but in doing so, that then creates this um, high-minded, high-sounding high narrative that justifies sin. And uh, so it's just the nature of it. But that's human nature. And frankly, human nature has never changed. It's just conditions change. And there are now external forces that amp it up in ways that never were existing before. So it was bad enough the way we've always been because it's a fallen world. And we have, the biblical understanding of, of anthropology is robust. Uh, Pascal made it says, what, what wretches and what wonders we are. We're both the, the, the glory of the cosmos and, the, and, and really the, the, the degradation of the world as well. How can this be? How can we be both? And we are. And so this mystery of the understanding of what the human nature is like is only really going to be accurate when it involves a biblical understanding, a biblical worldview, you see. Because then only we'll see how complicated and how separated we are. And then it talks about the evil in the heart, and only the scriptures are honest enough to tell us that depths of depravity, but then the grace then can reach down so that you don't succumb to despair. So again, the doctrines of grace humble us without, de de without de degrading us, but they elevate us without inflating us. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? It humbles you without degrading you, but it elevates you without inflating you. You see, realizing everything that we are and have is the gift and grace of the one who is the lover of our souls then actually then you begin to realize that you are, as Tozer said, looking at a friendly world, in not maybe this world, but the world to come. You're looking at a, a home and recognizing as well the very clarity of these metaphors that I so often use to describe the human condition in our earthly journey. These six metaphors of earthly life. And I find it interesting that all six are slightly nuanced descriptions, slightly different from one another. <laughs> Because an alien is a little bit different, or an exile, you see, you're not at home. You're a stranger or a wayfarer or a sojourner. But all of them, every one of them, what does it emphasize? How brief, how transitory, how ephemeral our earthly journey is, doesn't it? Everyone, recognize that and teach and learn to number your days so you'll be wise. If, you're not, if you have the arrogance of, of presumption that you have even a year to live, that'd be, not, that'd be a, a, very, a real folly. 
So we live then understanding the brevity and understanding that what we do now really does matter and it counts forever. And if you'll recall what I did before with that little, that little thing here, remember what I did with that? Remember, this is your earthly life. And, the, and so, again, just as a re reminder to you, I'm trying to persuade people this is really does matter. It's hard to get people to think about this. They act as if they're never going to die. Every, they just live in that way. They think that they can postpone this thing, and we'll deal with death. We'll deal with that window when we get to it. Nonsense. You're, you're falsely dealing with it now, and it's not going to prepare you. you. Now is the time to do it. You don't wait till you're older. You start as soon as you can, and you recalibrate accordingly. But the point that I'm arguing here is that if a person, oh, here's my 10th birth, my 20th, my third, wow, how did I get to be this? And then all these people, ignoring all this on the other side, even if it was only more 80 years of that, uh, but it's eternity. But, oh, man, gosh, and we're also wrapped up about well, my kids and I'm going to college and so forth here. And then, I'm, gosh, I'm, how did I get, get to turn the big 6 -0? There's the big six O right there. Oh my gosh, 70. You see, I'm a fossil, I'm older than dirt. But, but even then, even then, we say you can look and see the other side, you know, the, 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 when you're over the hill, you, but now you can see the grave. But even then, it doesn't compel. You see, it, it's an amazing thing that um, the, the idea of, of, of a funeral is a window of truth, you see, and that the coffin is an evangelist. But because it, 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 it tells you, look at that situation there. Are you kidding me? You think you're going to be unlike that person? Don't, don't be, you'd be a madman to suppose you have a month, a week, even another day. Every day must be seen in this way. So why then do we act as if this doesn't matter? And then you remember what I did with this? I just go, ooh, I have to move it to make sure you see it's still moving. And then, and then I go over here and I pull this little stunt on you here, because what do I know? What's, what new threads and twists will there be? But then here's your earthly, and this is really uh, not even to scale. This thing would be a molecule eventually compared to the eternity. Do you understand? What's the difference a thousand years from now? That's the question you always ask. What difference? Will this act or thing that I do, for good or for ill, what, what difference will it make a thousand uh, years? Think on the long-term perspective.